And these are, of course, some of the very important and famous examples, first examples of what are called Palladiao threefolds. Okay, but they're far from all of them. Okay, now how, how can you tell they're far from all of them? Well, one way to tell they're far from all of them is you can look topologically at, at, at these Palladiaos. You can look at their, their Eddy numbers, you can look at their Hodge numbers, and you can say, well, what are the characteristic, let's say, Hodge numbers of a, a quintic hypersurface? And a smooth quintic hypersurface has the following Hodge diamond. that its Hodge number uh, um, H21 is 101. Um, and as I'll say in a minute, uh, that tells you something about its, its, its complex structure modulus space. OK, so this is characteristic of this example. And so in particular, if these numbers change, if I construct Calabia threefolds with these numbers different, that would be one way of telling that I have a different Calabia. Another would be to violate the sympathy connectedness condition. I could have Calabia that are non sympathetic played a really important role in certain phenomenology things in physics, in quantum string theory, and Antonella and Ron have done a lot of work on those. Um, so that's that's another way. Oh, and Tony, that's right, our, 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 our photographer in the back. So, um, so, there, so there, there are ways of assuring oneself, okay, even using topological considerations like this, um, that one source of examples is not the BL at all. Okay. okay. Now, what's the good news here? So the good news, I'm going to two flavors when you're trying to understand Palladia threefolds and their moduli. There's the local story. So locally, the good news is due to um, Kogomolov, and Kogorov. Okay, what they tell us is that the complex structure deformations of the Calabiao are unobstructed. Okay. So in, in, in simple terms, what that's saying is, is, is that um, the cohomological obstruction in the Kibaira Spencer theory that, that could tell you that your, your, your dimension of your tangent space moduli is not what it should be, is gone, that, that the condition vanishes. So this is great. This means that if you have a smooth Calabiao and you deform its complex structure, you're going to get nearby smooth Calabiaos with the same dimension moduli space. Okay, so there's no, no craziness happening in the moduli space in that sense. But it's purely a local condition, it's sort of an infinitesimal condition. What about globally? So here, in the case of elliptic curves, I have a really nice moduli space. It's known as the J-Log, right? I have a nice picture of the upper half plane quotiented by PSL 2z. J line, P1 J line. Okay, it's got three special points, or four points, two points, and it has a cusp of infinity. It's a nice, it's a nice description, a very, very nice global description. Um, there's another way to look at this of merging, and you can see it emerging by taking what's called the wire stress normal form for your elliptic curve. You have, let's see if I can do it. Uh, y squared z equals 4x cubed minus g2x z squared minus g3 z cubed. Okay, there's my Weierstrass normal form. And then I can look at the deformation parameters in my, in my defining equation, in my, my special two-parameter family of quintics, uh, of cubics. And I, I have a, an automorphic form, or in this case a modular form theoretic interpretation of these guys. They're built out of Eisenstein's. So you see a nice connection between sort of the algebraic story and what I'll call the transcendental story. Okay. And, and the connection is the theory of elliptic functions. Classical, classical functions. So you want to have some handle on a, a, a global generalization. And for Claudia threefold, the best we've got is a result of Vivek. Okay. is that we have a coarse moduli space for polarized Claudia manifolds. Okay. So 
um, uh, what's the polarization? Well, the polarization in concrete terms is given in the elliptic curve case realized as cubic curves by the fact that they're cubic. It's given by the fact that you, you have a hyperplane section in the CP2 that's picking out the three points. For the K3 surface, it's, it's um, it realized as quartic surfaces. It's given by, again, the hyperplane section giving you a quartic curve, the curve of soft intersection four. Um, and then for Calabia three folds, uh, this, the, the, the realized as quintics, the same thing. But this notion of a polarization is much more general. So you can define it in terms of um, suitably ample line bundles, and, and I, I won't formalize this here because I really don't need it, but the notion is that subject to the right hypotheses um, on your on your plot meows, you're going to get a well-defined course of hypotheses. And that's the most you can really hope for. Okay, because that's really what you're getting from the lower dimension. The lower dimensional All right. Um, but there's also more news. You call this um, good news or, or bad news, depending who you are. And the more news comes from physics. So. Okay, so what does physics tell us? Well, string theoretic physics tells us that our approach to Calabi L manifolds, thinking of them as a generalization of elliptic curves and K3s, is perhaps a little short sighted. Okay, because what physicists tell us is that to a Calabi Yau X, there should be associated a partner Calabi Yau X check. Okay? And if these happen to be Calabi Yau threefolds, they say that the Hodge numbers, H21 of X and H11 of X, which are the only Hodge numbers here that have map this stuff inside the Steinman, these are the H21 these are the H11, are equal to respectively H11 of X check and H21 of X check. Now on its face, this is a ridiculous state. Okay? First of all, you're saying that given one Calabio manifold, there exists another Calabio manifold. Okay. Well, I haven't told you how to give the first Calabio manifold. I haven't told you that it's quintic, I haven't told you that it's cut out by some determinantal condition. I haven't told you, I haven't told you how to find it. But you're telling me, however I tell you how to find it, whatever recipe I give, there must be some mirror recipe for X check. Moreover, it's saying that the thing that captures complex structure deformations of your Calabria threefold, X, is identified somehow with the thing that tells you about the size of the Kähler curve. In other words, it's telling you the ridiculous statement that the complex structure moduli of one Calabi L are going to be related to the symplectic moduli of the mirror Calabi L. So not only does it tell you not how, not only does it not tell you how to construct the mirror, it tells you that the mirror is going to have these magical dual kind of properties. Okay, so it's more news. Okay, but if it's good or bad, it's up to you. Um, it's unavoidable. There's really no way to study nowadays um, moduli and, and, and geometry of Calabia threefolds without referencing this uh, this kind of conjecture. Now, of course, the physicists gave us this conjecture, and this is just a shadow of what they're really giving, because this is a, a consequence of the kind of conjecture that they formulated in physical terms. And it was up to mathematicians to reformulate it in terms that we were maybe a little happier with. So there were many attempts to do this, and most of these attempts were dependent upon some specific presentation of the Calabia threefold. Um, you could do this combinatorially by thinking of your Calabia threefold as actually sitting as a hypersurface in not just a projective space, but let's say in a toric variety. Okay? Um, you could boost that um, to complete intersections in toric varieties with certain nice properties. And then you could deduce the theorem that tells you how to pass from x to x check, and for that matter, the theorem that checks the Hodge number duality by using combinatorics. Okay, so this was certainly done in the early days. On the other hand, it's not really a fundamental reformulation in mathematical terms because it's dependent upon a construction. Okay? So the, the best bet uh, for a sort of abstract mathematical formulation of what this conjecture should really be about is due to Maxim Konsevich. 
Okay? And Ansevich introduced the notion of homological mirror symmetry. notion was that, well, he doesn't care how you construct your Kalabi Yau, or for that matter, construct your mirror Kalabi Yau, but he wants the categories, naturally defined categories, that he, he will associate to the Kalabi Yau and his, and, and his mirror to have certain properties, and they actually have a, um, a suitable equivalence of categories. So on the one hand, his categories, and on the one hand, it's a bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on, on X. And on the other, it's a suitable Fukaya category. Um, so natural in the context of Lagrangian and this geometry on X check. Um, now he deliberately stated it with a certain ambiguity in terms of the definition of the Fukaya category. That ambiguity has been uh, chipped away at for many, many, many years. Um, and um, I, I'm not going to report on the state of the art there. I don't even know what the state of the art is in complete generality there. Um, but certainly the bounded derived category of Kamar is a well studied object within algebraic geometry, and this is an object that the selective geometers know quite a lot about. And so the statement is that you're going to have a suitable equivalence of categories, um, and this must have implications for concrete questions involving um, the quadrilateral manifolds and their modular spaces. So, an approach I took with John Morgan many years ago <clears throat> was to sort of a, in a more prosaic way, look at the structural implications for Columbia moduli spaces. Okay? So we're not trying to prove mirror symmetry. We're not trying to formulate mirror symmetry in this broad category theoretical way. But we're trying to understand what it tells us or can tell us about, about um, um, what Kaladi moduli spaces look like. OK? So let me make this concrete. And I have to do that by giving an example. So I've only given one example of the Kaladi threefold so far. What was it? It was a smooth quintage. Threefold, right? OK. So what's my second example going to be? It's still a threefold. It's mirror. OK? So I have to give you a construction of the mirror printer. OK, so I'll give you the original construction. So this is a famous example. Okay, mirror printed. So this is going to be the example that was first introduced by, by Rian Plesser, motivated by considerations of conformal field theory. Um, it's also the example that Candelis Delos and Rian Parks analyzed in, in great detail in their famous paper, which made predictions about curve counts on the quintage. Um, and here's the, the basic construction. So you start with, well, x, so an example of an x. So you start with the quintic. So I'm going to take the sum i equals 0 to 4 xi to the first. Okay, well, there we go. This is a Fermat quintic. I set this equal to zero. Okay. But that's not quite right, <laughs> okay? Because if you look at this Hodge diamond, okay, this is the Hodge diamond for the quintic. What's the Hodge diamond for the mirror diamond? Well, it's going to flip along one of these diagonals, so it's going to be 1, 101. Now that means the H21 value, which remember is going to be our, by Pokemon Tiam is going to be the dimension of our moduli space, complex structures, is 1. Okay? So in some sense, we should be a little more ambitious. Instead of trying to construct a single Calabia threefold, let's construct a one parameter family of Calabia threefolds. Okay? So you do this by starting with a one parameter family of Quintics, but a highly symmetric. Okay, so this is this highly symmetric Fermat quintic, and I put t information parameter, or if you prefer mu times this plus mu times that, times a product i equal one four of x. Okay, so this is a, just a union of hyperplanes. Okay? Sort of the maximal degeneracy point that physicists say we should be including in our modular space when we study their symmetry, and t is a parameter that um, is. Uh, 
tell me how far or close away the larger kinds of things. All right, but this is still a family of quintics, generically smooth. So it's useless. We're done. Like, look at all the other of. No, we can't do it. End of story. No. So it's motivated by Kepner models in conformal field theory. Green and Plesser said what we should really do is quotient this by the following group. Z cubed. Now, okay, the obvious thing to do is to consider fifth roots of unity acting on the xi's, and then you have z minus five z to the fifth. But there's an overall scaling associated with the fact that the equation is set equal to zero, and there's also a diagonal action that does nothing. So you're left with this z minus five z cubed. And what this produces after resolution, so n rapidly resolve. So then crepent resolution. So the crepent resolution, so crepent means um, the opposite of discrepant. Anyway, um, the crepent is telling you that the, the, the structure of the canonical bundle is going to remain unchanged, and in particular, it's still be trivial. Um, there are choices hidden here, in the choice of resolution, but they're not going to matter for us. Okay? So you crepent resolve, and you get a columbia threefold family which has h21 equal 1, and h11 equal 101. And where does the 101 come from? Well, from all this blowing up here. Okay? So you start out with something which had h11 equal 1. But when you quotient the resolve, you get this much higher. OK, but we were interested in the structural implications, right? So we want one example of a family of blocking out threefolds with h21 equal 1. So we can look at the global structure of its moduli space. So here's our one example. What is the global structure of the moduli space? Well, it turns out to be P1 minus 3 okay. It's not quite parameters by T. It's like a fifth power we have to worry about in terms of T, but I don't worry too much about that. These three points are the points that do not support um, they do not support, well, okay. off these three points, all of the fibers over this P1 minus three points are smooth Calabia threefolds with H21 to one. Okay? Over the three points, we have special behavior. So over one of them, we have what's called maximal unipotent monogromy. Okay? Over the, the next one, you have uh, what's called sometimes conifold monodromy, or unipotent of rank one. And over the last one, well, you have order five. Okay. So the global structure of moduli space is, well, P1 minus three points, and here are the structures that um, are naturally associated. So once you see this example, and the physicists being who they are generated many, many more examples using a variety of, of tricks, especially uh, realizations as hypersurfaces and junior sections and product varieties. Is that t equals zero one and infinity? No yeah, it's going to be depending on the normalization. Yeah, zero one and infinity. So what actually happens here is that is that um, it's the t of the fifth root, right? Because here the fifth roots of unity are all going to be collapsed down to a single point, and that's the conflict point here. Um, we have a point here, which is the Fermat guy. It's the one that becomes order five. Right? Um, and then the maximal degeneracy becomes the maximal degeneracy. Um, okay. So, so what, you, what you do then is you say, well, wait a minute. Maybe we can generalize this example. And for that, you want to make sure that there are other examples that are similar to it. And you realize, wait a minute using a variety of different techniques, techniques um, adapting the hypersurface story to weighted projective space, uh, for example, or to complete your sections of weighted projective space, you realize that you can actually construct a fair number of H21 equal 1 Calabia threefold moduli spaces. Um, and um, they all kind of look the same. Okay? So in work with, with Morgan a few years ago, um, we decided to squint at the structure of these moduli spaces and instead of ask 
about construction of Calabia threefolds, we, we would ask, or even moduli spaces of Calabia threefolds, we would ask a simpler question, or at least a different question, of the underlying variation of Hodge structure that could be associated with a family of H21 equal 1 Calabia threefolds. So we classify integral VHS of weight 3 and Hodge type 1, 1, 1, 1. That was that middle row in the Hodge diagram we were looking at earlier. With what I'll call mirror type. Okay, so what's the mirror type monochrome condition? Well, it's basically the condition that you have your three points. Oh, okay, well, I have to do it. It's over. Over P1 minus three points. Okay. So over one of these points, around one of these points, you assume you have maximally unipotent monochromy. Around another one of the points, you assume you have a unipotent rank one monochromy. And around the third point, do we assume finite order monochromy? No, we do not. We know that that monochromy will be completely determined by the other two because it's the inverse of their product. But we do need a condition there. Okay? And the condition that we need there is from the so-called monochromy theorem in algebraic geometry, which says that the monochromy must be quasi-unipotent. Okay? So we just impose here the quasi unipotency condition. It doesn't force finite order, except in certain examples. Okay. All right, so you do this classification, okay, and you say, well, well, what comes out of it? Well, first of all, it's a finite classification. Yes? Can you say that one more time? The third point, you're not. The third point is quasi unipotent. That's, that's, that's imposed. So the, the first two, one of them is? Maximally unipotent. One of them is conifold, so. Maximally unipotent means. Yeah, the biggest, the biggest possible. These are four by four matrices. These are four by four matrices, yes. Because one, one, one. So that's one, the other one is a two by two and two by two. Unipotent rank one, that's right. So two steps down. That's what you would have in the contact. Correct. So you do that. And the third one, I can't say I don't do anything, because if I don't do anything, I don't get a finite classification. If I do something, Okay. Um, it has to be compatible with coming from geometry, and so the condition that we do impose is quasi unipotency. And then, by a result of Deline, we know that this will have a finite number of solutions, a finite number of variations of Lodge structure. Okay. Well, Deline's result is actually more general. If I did more than three points, but I fixed their positions, Deline's result would also apply. But if I have four points, he doesn't tell me what cross ratio is. So it doesn't quite work. Um, but for the purposes of three points, it's a robust way to say, hey, we have a finite, finite potential for a finite classification, and then we'll work in an idea which is classified. Okay. So what kind of answers do we get? Well, on the level of our VHS, or if you equivalent, equivalent you want to say uh, Picard Fuchs, or Peter Picard Fuchs, or the Okay, if this came from geometry, it would correspond to the operators that violate the periods of the whole of the three form. Okay? Um, you get 14 classes. On the level of ZDHS, you get 23. So there's some kind of enrichment going on here, right? Some of these 14 classes, and not all of them, have more than one potential integral structure. Okay? Um, for example, one of these classes is the one that corresponds to the ODE, which is a generalized hypergeometric type, 4F3, 1 5th, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths, it would be a stickler for the hypergeometric notation, you know, like 1, 1, 1. And then you put a bar, and then you put a Z instead of a T because it's not clean, remember what you said? Okay. So, can you prepare to guess what this one corresponds to? The predominance of fives. Kind of a giveaway. This is, yes, indeed, the operator that annihilates the periods for the quintic mirror frame. Okay? So that corresponds to one of these 14 cases. But it turns out that when we configure our classification, there were two integral structures compatible with that operator. Okay. So, 
depending on who you are, there's different ways to motivate this. Um, let me start with the geometric construction picture. Okay. So there's an absolutely beautiful uh, combinatorial approach to constructing um, collabial manifolds as hyperspecies or beginner receptions for varieties. This is a, a theory due to Baturev. And Baturev Borisov. Okay? This would be the hypersurface case, and that would be with net partitions, the beginner section case. Um, the starting point for this data defining the Calabiaus or the family of Calabiaus and their combinatorial construction is what well, combinatorial data? It's a fan, right? Or if you prefer, it's a, it's a polytope whose normal fan is giving you the combinatorial structure for the torque variety. It's telling you how to glue together the different com uh, C star to the whatever powers to compactify your C star of the end. Okay? This is this is the story. I'm sorry. So um, the basic starting point there is what I'll call a reflexive lattice polytope. Um, and this reflexive lattice polytope, uh, which um, for the hypersurface case is going to sit in, in a space of dimension equal to the ambient space, so four-dimensional, okay? Um, it has a, ver a vertex set among z to the four, sitting in R4, okay? It's reflexive because there's a du polar duality of polytopes where you, you basically have a normalized equation for the facets, the hyperplanes containing the facets, the polytope, set equal to minus one, read off the coefficients, and those are integers, and you feed them in to the dual. So each facet defines um, a dual vertex. You do this for the whole polytope, and you get a dual polytope. Okay, so this polar duality gives you a way of relating this to this. And being reflexive says that it's an invertible, invertible process. And as you might expect, the toric variety associated with this guy and the toric variety associated with this guy then become the nice homes for the anticonical hypersurfaces that are your collagen elements. So you're going to have your x sitting in there, and you're going to have your x check sitting in there. Okay? And the combinatorics of these polytopes allows you to even produce the Hodge numbers, even, even describe the Hodge numbers for these, these hypersurfaces. So if you do this in the case of four-dimensional reflexive polytopes, so the hypersurfaces in Borenstein toric final fourfolds, you can ask how many of them give rise to mirror pairs where one of them has H2 1 equal 1, or for that matter, H1 1 equal 1. Okay, same thing for the pairs. And it turns out what you get are the quintic, a polytope corresponding to the quintic, so projective space, and it's polar, okay, so it's mirror the sextic in weighted projective space, the optic in weighted projective space, the dectic in weighted projective space, and one more simplex, which is the quintic twin. Okay? It's the one that was missing. It's the, it gives rise to the integral VHS that also has this ODE, but a different integral structure. Okay, that's one way to think of it. Another way to think of this alternate integral structure is go back to the original grain and cluster construction and you can find this example in the original Green Professor paper, if you look hard enough. They tabulate the actions of the Z mod 5Z uh, uh, cube um, on quintics. And they make a point of pointing out that there is a 21-dimensional sublocus of the 101-dimensional space of quintics on which the action trivializes a little bit in the sense that an internal Z mod 5Z inside this product, I forget how it's defined because it's defined in sequential powers of fifth roots of unity, um, acts trivially. Oh, no, I'm sorry, acts fixed point free. Thank you. Okay? It acts fixed point free. In other words, you quotient first on that 21 dimensional family by this fixed point free action, and now you have a 21 dimensional family of Calabia threefolds whose fundamental group is Z mod 5Z. It's the mirror of that family. Okay? So instead of 1, 101, it's 1, 21, and they're flipped. And that's the one that's being realized by this alternate structure. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that there's something non-trivial going on here. And yet, the global structure of moduli space in all of these examples 
is P1 minus three points. Okay? What's different is the properties of, if you prefer the Hodge bundle, or the properties of the local system of rank four that we're considering with non-trivial monodromies on P1 minus three points. Okay. Now, you can ask the geometric realization question. I've given it for the quintic mirror and the quintic twin mirror, right? You could ask for all, all 23 of these, or at least all 14 of these, for a geometric realization, okay? Because John and I classify these things as variations of Hodge structure. We didn't classify them um, as geometries, right? If you ask for geometric realization, the logical thing to do first is to go to the biggest source of examples. And the biggest source of examples at the time, and still, is the Bach derivative and Bach derivative of self -destruction. So, what of course we did was to go look at those reflexive polytopes in dimension four. They're classified, there's more than 400 million of them. And you, you run a computer search, and you try to find examples that realize that they were after. Um, it turned out to be slightly easier to take weighted projective hypersurfaces and configure intersections and modify them a little bit to make everything work. And with much effort, because one of these 14 cases was very subtle and was not really resolved until much more recently by work I did with uh, my postdocs and students, uh, with much effort, you can show that you either get them spot on, meaning the generic anti-canonical hyperservice or generic net partition is exactly the caveats you're after, or you can find some sublocus in moduli where the caveats become singular. And then you have what's called a geometric transition to the quality of the type you're after. Now, I lie a little bit because in that 14th case, our realization in the end was as a variation of Hodge structure coming from the mixed Hodge structure. It was coming from, um, there was a pure VHS that we could derive from the mixed Hodge structure for a, uh, a two-nodal family, so generically two nodes, uh, Q factorial, quality of threefolds. So, they're not quite what we ordered. They're not generically smooth. If you do a small resolution, they're not projective. So there's a lot of problems with, with trying to interpret this literally as smooth plotting gals. But a moral message from this is that maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't be so picky. Okay, the minimal model program doesn't actually tell us we should always expect to get something smooth. All right. You think in your 400 million there might be a better uh, one to use? Pardon? Well, you said there were 400 million. I know, but, but the but only think, ones, the only one that will be five gave rise to the H2 one equal one spot on. And those are the ones I listed. Quintic, sextic, optic, dectic, and quintic twin. Quintic twin? That's the one I said, the 21 dimensional subfamily of quintics with the freezing on fives action. Or you can see it lattice theoretically as that fifth case. It's still a simplex, but there's an index five sub lattice mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. Anyway, so that's all described in my old, my old paper um, with, with, with Morgan. Um, so he's saying that the other uh, 18 cases, whatever, in the were not among the, the half million? No, no. What I'm saying is there were a handful where you had to work a little harder. So for the 14, let's forget the 23 for the moment. Let's just focus on the 14. For the 14, with suitable modifications to, to hypersurfaces and linear intersections of weighted projective space, meaning sometimes you have to modify the weighted projective space polytope to be reflexive, you could realize 13 of the 14 using the Batura or Batura Borisov construction. If you just look at the, web, at the, at the website, you could just. Yeah. How, how many they have with H1 equal to 1? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But, but the 14th case, you couldn't. The 14th case was actually the 12th, the 12th roots of unity. Um, and although one side makes perfectly good sense, the mirror side gives you h to one three. And in order to go to the sublocus where you get the correct series, hypergeometric series for the period, the thing that would annihilate, be annihilated by your appropriate 4F3 equation, you have to go to a locus that's deep inside the discriminant locus for the cloudy gas. And even after applying Kalamata, getting a partial prep and desingularization, you're still left with a pair of nodes and we proved it's Q-factorial. So there's no birational, the equivalent family to that family that can realize this is a family of smooth colonial threefolds. 
That doesn't mean that there isn't somewhere out there yeah. a family of smooth clavia threefold that will realize the 14 case spot on. But I, I don't know of any such. Okay. All right. So, but but look, I mean, there's something profoundly unsatisfactory about this approach. Now, you've got to think about it a little bit to realize why you should be upset. But the quintic and quintic mirror is a good example. Okay. So. You know, I can write this ODE down and say it's characteristic of one of those 14 classes in classification. But how do I go from that to the family of quintic mirror Glavialis? Well, you notice all these fives and you say, oh, the answer should be the mirror to the quintic family. Okay, at this point, as mathematicians, we should be really upset because we get a classification that had nothing to do with mirror symmetry other than the inspiration that we should impose these monogram conditions. It certainly didn't specify a method of construction. And then we get an answer and we say, oh, yes, of course, this is the mirror quintic family because of these five. That's ridiculous. We should have an intrinsic way of constructing from nothing but the data of the DHS a family of Flavia threefolds that realizes this. We shouldn't say, oh, that reminds me of the Quintic family and plug into a mirror construction. Okay? So it's a, it's a very important philosophical point, and it has, it has implications mathematically. All right. So a better way right, would be to uh, construct the CY3 families directly from the DHS data. Okay? And of course, the dictionary, traditionally in Hodge theory, is you go from geometry to Hodge structure is not necessarily the right. Okay? Now, sometimes you can, right? What's the case where you can? Well, dimension one, right? You've got an elliptic curve. Well, an elliptic curve can be presented as C quotiented by one comma tau. But not normalize these and say pi 1 and pi 2 or something, okay? So this is starting from the Hodge theoretic data of the period ratio and giving you the elliptic curve. Okay? Um, if I want to have an algebraic expression for this family, the algebraic expression is given by Weierstrass normal form that I wrote down before. Okay? So this is now a powerful tool. And the dictionary is given by elliptic function. Okay? So the first thing to ask for is, what about a higher dimensional version of this? Now, we want to go all the way to Calabia threefolds. But it's a mistake to skip dimension. Okay, It is true there are some commonalities of odd dimensional Calabias versus even dimensional Calabias. But it's a mistake to skip dimension here. Okay. So we should do the K3 surface case. Now, I already told you, not all K3 surfaces are realizable as cortex. Okay. In fact, not all K3 surfaces are created equal. Some are more algebraic than others. The Hodge diamond for a K3 looks like this. It means, of course, that the HN minus 1, 1, or H1, 1 stuff is all mixed together in that 20. There's some good news, because H2 K3 Minerva coefficients is three copies of this even unimodular lattice H, sometimes called U and two copies of the negative definite E8 lattice. Okay? So there's really, really a lot known about the lattice structure here. But what differentiates K3, making them more or less algebraic, is the presence or absence of a lot of algebraic curves on the K3. Okay? For example, a generic smooth cortic K3, the only source of algebraic curves we have is the hyperplane section. So we get a curve. Okay? So, the Neron Severi lattice of the K3 um, is the sub lattice of this K3 lattice spanned by the classes of algebraic curves. And we let rho, the so called Picard number, be the rank of Neron Severi in our K3. So the Picard number of a, of a, a smooth quartic surface, generic smooth quartic surface, is going to be 1. Okay? What's the maximal Picard number? Well, 20. Okay. 
And these maximally algebraic K3s play the role of confluence multiplication points in elliptic curve function. Okay? But if I want a theory of K3 surfaces that matches the theory of elliptic curves as closely as possible, it makes sense to assume that rho is 19. Because then the dimension of the moduli space okay, of, I need a name for this, let's let L be the generic theorem of the lattice, of L polarized K3s is equal to 20 minus rho, and 20 minus rho is equal to 1. So just as the J line is a the modular curve dimension 1, now you're going to have a moduli space where this is dimension 1. Okay? Now if I'm more specific, if I let my polarizing lattice L be this lattice I'll call M sub N, which is H plus E8 plus E8 plus minus 2N, okay, or N is some natural number, um, then the moduli space of MN polarized K3s has an almost classical description. It's almost a classical modular curve. It's the upper half plane, instead of quotiented by PSL2Z, quotiented by the group gamma naught of n plus. Okay. So gamma naught of n is what you think it is. It means it's uh, elements of PSL2Z congruent mod n to uh, a zero in the lower left entry. Okay. The plus, however, means you've added what's called a fricket involution. Okay. The fricket involution takes you from PSL2Z to PSL2R. So it's saying tau goes to minus 1 over n tau, which in the presence of, of special linear forces square root of n's to enter into your matrix, matrix group. Okay, and n's an integer, so you know, in general it's going to get, get you out of, uh, out of the integer coefficients. Okay, now you might say, well, wait a minute, this is bad news. I thought we were dealing with monodromies with respect to integral structure, integral cohomology or integral homology for these um, these Calabiaos, these K3s. Well, there is an answer there. The answer is that 19 is equal to 22 minus 3. Okay? So the orthogonal complement to the Naron Severi of rank 19 is rank 3. It's a rank 3 so-called transcendental lattice, which means that the actual monodromies um, for our family of K3s are 3 by 3 matrices. And these 3 by 3 matrices are the symmetric square of the 2 by 2 matrices here, which cures our square roots. Okay? So everything's kosher. All right. Um, so in a result with Klinger, um, let's paraphrase it this way, we gave a complete generalization of the elliptic curve um, algebraic transcendental dictionary for all MN polarized K3 surfaces. Okay, so all K3 surfaces that have this lattice MN contained in them. So very. Um, this included a normal form by analogy with the Weierstrass normal form and a modular parameterization by analogy with the G2 and G3. Okay? In fact, the way we did it for the countable number, you know, ends allowed to go off towards infinity, right? The way we did it, instead of doing it case by case, we did it for a different lattice. We did it for these guys. And when you do it for these guys, you get a modular surface. And when the lattice polarization increases, you get modular curves in your modular surface. So having the normal form and the modular polarization for the modular surface, we can specialize. Now, the way this theorem worked was to take advantage of internal structure on our K3. Okay? Realizing our K3 surface itself as <clears throat> a K3 surface itself um, as an elliptic surface. So we fiber our K3 surface over CP1 by elliptic curves. Now, of course, there's bad fibers. They're singular fibers, given by the ADE classification of Kadara. Um, but 
you get this picture where you have your multi-valued period morphism, multi-valued because of monitor at least to the upper half plane, composed with the elliptic modular function, and you map to the J line. And the composition is what Kadira called this functional invariant, J of T. So you have this beautiful picture where your K3 surface structure is somehow understood using an internal elliptic vibration. And it turns out that not only do you have to tune the elliptic vibration so that it's characteristic of the lattice polarization, not all elliptic vibrations on that lattice polarized K3 are themselves created equal. Some of them allow you to actually see a direct connection between K3s of the sort we're considering, these MN polarized K3s, and E tau cross E minus 1 over N tau. A product of the two elliptic curves linked by cyclic MSI. So this whole story uh, falls together very well, but it begs being boosted to the Calabria threefold case. So how do you do that? Well, you have to generalize Kadira's theory. And the way you generalize Kadira's theory is to come up with an analog of Kadira's functional invariant. Okay, so we call this a generalized functional invariant. Okay? And if you have a Calabi-Yau threefold, well, fiber over P1 by K3 surface, and there's a T here, a T here, okay? And this K3 is going to be MN polarized, right? MN polarized. Then you really want the same story to hold. You want to have some multi-valued morphism in the upper half plane. Well, how, we have that. Right? That's part of the data of our MN polarized K3. In fact, it's better than that. We have a map down to the upper half plane coefficient by gamma mod of M plus. Now, instead of having a single modular curve to work with, for each end, we get a modular curve, and we'll call this G sub M of T, and that's the generalized functional invariant. It's just a rational function. But it's a rational function mapping to a very informative moduli space, generalizing the, the, the J line. Okay. So, the notion of a section in Kadyrov's theory corresponds in our theory to what's called an L polarized, or MN, I'll say, polarized family of K3 surfaces. Um, the order matters here. It's not a family of MN polarized K3s, it's an MN polarized family. That means that there is no monodromy action, trivial monodromy action on the MN piece of the numbers theory, okay? So all that we're dealing with is transcendental stuff. The ADE classification has to be generalized. And we can do that on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? Because we have certain modular families of lattice polarized K3s. We can pull back and then analyze the structure locally. So this is a case-by-case -case analog for each MN. Okay? And you have the notion of minimal resolution okay, of your singularities for elliptic surfaces. It's not quite the same thing as the minimal model program adapted to surfaces, but you study the theory you know. And that corresponds in our case to applying the minimal model program. Okay, the three volts. So by using Hodge theory to constrain the geometry, you get the following result. Zero. <clears throat> Sorry, three around. Okay. The damage rate is two. And I is a smooth, now the uh, threefold fiber non isotrivially by N and polarized KP surfaces. Then there's constraints on n. n has to be among 2, 3, 4, and we have to 17 and 19 and 23. Moreover, if uh, so moreover, n is in the set 2, 3, and 11, if and only if x is non rigid So using this, which came from Hodge theory and then some results of Eskin, Mueller, Zorich, uh, and Zavich, 
adapted to our setting, we were able to use Hodge that would constrain the geometry and then go case by case for each of these MNs, models for each, and obtain a complete birational classification of these Flavia threefolds that are fibered by MN polarized K3s. Okay, so I would argue that this is the first Hodge theoretically motivated birational classification of the class of Flavia threefolds. Okay. And of course, if there is any justice, this hard work will be rewarded with some insight into mirror symmetry. And indeed it is. So, in related work, uh, with Harder and Thompson, um, <clears throat> we proposed a, an answer to an old conjecture, or not conjecture, an old question of Andre Turing. So, a Calabia manifold X is supposed to have a mirror, but it's also the case that um, a so-called quasi-fano, um, so quasi-fano uh, threefold, one, um, with a uh, smooth epigonal K3 has a mirror. Okay, now this mirror is not, it's still a pair, but it's not the same thing anymore. It's now a landau ginsburg model. X1, W1. Okay. The fibers of this landau ginsburg model are going to be compact K3 surfaces, although not S. In fact, they're going to be S mirror. If I have two of these, Y2 S, X2, W2, Y1 S is mirrored to X1, W1, Y2 S is mirrored to X2, W2. Suppose that they intersect on S and they smooth to form X check. Turin's question was, what is the relationship between the mirror and the mirrors of these two pieces? And the answer, which we give in our conjecture, is that you have to glue. That you literally glue the two Lendo Ginsburg models, treat them each as K3 vibrations, where the K3 fiber is of S type, and they form a vibration structure by S hat K3s on the X. In other words, K3 vibrations are mirror to Turing degenerations. Okay? Um, and you ask what this result tells you? Well, if you actually look at the details of the ramification profiles of this generalized functional invariant here, you recover from our classification of K3 fiber Flavia threefolds the complete list of rank one phonos uh, together with their, their economical degree and index that was classified long ago uh, in, in the algebraic geometry literature. So I would argue that this is one of the few cases where you actually have a threefold classification problem on one side and a threefold classification problem on the other side speaking to each other directly using mirror symmetry. Thank you. Yeah, so you have to fix the polarization, and then once you fix the polarization, um, you, you do the work necessary to, to build the dictionary. Almost, almost much like this, are there C endpoints? Absolutely. So the examples that I was talking about here, um, the M polarized, and okay, this is the one where it's the last of rank 18, H plus A plus A. The actual geometry of the K3s, they're Hodge isometric and constructible from and product of two elliptic curves. So, of course, there's these modular curves where the elliptic curves are linked by an n isogeny, but there's also, that's rank 19 points. But you can also jump all the way to rank 20, and that is literally the CM points. And so, are, are the extra transcendental functions that you produce, do they have nice algebraic values? Those, uh, yeah, so, so this is a great question. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I'm going I'm to answer it in two ways. So, so, first of all, the nature of the dictionary in this case, is taking the modular parameterization for a perhaps plane cross itself quotiented by a suitable arithmetic group and identifying that which has you know, J1 plus J2 and J1 times J2 as the natural modular parameters, identifying that with 
um, the coefficients, the explicit rational functions, logical functions, with the coefficients of the defining equation. Okay? So that's the algebraic transcendental dictionary. And, and the relevant, the relevant um, um, uh, function theory there is really elliptic function theory. So the short answer is that question can always be answered by reducing it to the elliptic curve right. case. Okay? But the much more clever answer is to work separately on each of these modular curves. Because each modular curve is uniformized by gamma naught of n plus. Okay. And each one has a help module generalizing the J function Q series. So that approach can also be taken and work with John McKay and David Cox you know, to be adapted to the situation. And yes, you get a completely analogous result to the elliptic curve J function. And you can keep track of the field extension. So all of those have a meaning are genus zero? Yeah, all these are genus zero. They have to be genus zero in order to plug into this theory because um, the, the base of the K3 vibration uh, for the space of the yeah, has to be genus zero. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, you can play more games with this, right? You can you can work with these, you can even drop the condition of isotriviality, and then you get even more cases. And so, you know. You can, you can play a lot of games, a lot of games with this. But our intent here was to come up with a classification that was complete. And so for that, we wanted it to be relatively small. And that could plug into this mirror conjecture. We could check literally against an existing old classification in the case of quasi finals or finals. What happens if you, uh, if you play the Kugis Sataki game? then you get a different uh, uh, complex multiplication points where you can evaluate. Uh, do you actually hit any of them? Or? So do you mean apply the Kuga Sataki again to the K3s? Yeah, apply the right. Kuga Sataki so, to So that's almost a tautology here, because uh -huh. Kuga Sataki splits as copies of the ability of the, to uh, just the ability. Sure. So, so, so you don't, don't get anything, get anything new. Nothing new. Does it tell you something about uh, the theoretical theoretical? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, it's, it, it's, it does give you an effective dictionary. I'm not going to say anything about the theory. I'm staying away from Okay. I'm staying away from making any claims about the theory. No, That's charged. But, but I will say that it gives you an effective dictionary. Yeah, it gives you an effective dictionary between the, the, the transcendental story, which is the periods for the threefold, and the algebraic story. And it's mediated by the fiber-wise story, which is a fiber-wise global term. Yeah. So the way you prove the analog mm -hmm. of Kodaira's theory of the surfaces right. is exactly that. You use fiber-wise global terrain, you have the Arisman connection, and you just mimic the usual, the usual story. But then you don't have any, I mean, you don't have any teeth, right? You have, to, you have to do something to really make it become a classification. And for that, Hodge theory bounds the geometric search. It constrains your, your list of ends. You then have to look for models of these. You can get them from my work with Klinger, or you can find these literature examples you know, that have been worked out um, by the people who worked hard on studying Lambda Ginsburg models. Right? Another so, question here. You said that um, you started with Smutka on the IP, right? You mean my motivator? No, no, question? you wrote that there. Where? Smutka on the IP. Did I get it wrong? Yeah, but, but once you have the classification, it's much better. What no, 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 but just this here. Yeah. Yeah. You said you take the smooth Calabiano threefold, right? In this, case. In this case, yeah. And then, but down there, you, wrote, you, you run the minimum modern program. I know, but I'm, I'm answering the question. So, so yeah. once you have this game going, there's no reason to assume smooth. Okay, that was and, and what happens is that you, you get terminal similarity. But we know exactly when there's smooth. And that's that's yeah. critical. So so we, we have we know we know when we're gonna get we know which ramification profiles are going to correspond to the solution of the gas. But we don't we haven't completely classified. And why do you want to serve it as singular? We don't get them, but we get them, right? Because remember we don't have a lot of control here. All we can do So you're saying you do get terminal by Yeah, when we when we do our complete classification, yes. We we do get we do get we, we, we do get um, terminal, but we know but I just want to emphasize, we know when we're smooth. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that, yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this is not a program I would want to run for arbitrary lattice polarized K3s. Okay, let's put it that way. In theory, we laid out plots. 
Okay? But the analysis you would have to do would be considerably more sophisticated because, first of all, these maps are no longer curve covers. Here, we factor through a Hurwitz space, a Hurwitz scheme, essentially, because it's, it's specified ramification types from this rational curve to this target rational, rational curve, which is fixed. And, and that's it. I mean, that's all we're doing. Okay? So it tells you some insight into the structure, global structure of the Columbia moduli space in these cases. But if I drop the lattice polarization, the target now becomes a rational curve on the lattice polarized K3 moduli space. And that's going to be general type eventually. <laughs> okay? And the Lang conjecture says you're going to concentrate the rational curves on, on some subvariety, and conjecturally that subvariety will itself be a quotient of the type four symmetric domain, not of not of uh, general type. Or, you, know, you can ask validus questions, but, but again, it, it becomes a very complicated story. Um, but that's an indication of how rich this class of K3 fiber Columbia three fields is. Um, but in order to, to, to do an actual complete classification, we limited ourselves to this relatively simple case. But of course, we knew in the back of our minds that it would dovetail with our conjecture if we did it right. And ex post facto, we check and, uh, and it does. The modulated spaces. So all these modulated spaces are rational curves. Okay. The ones that you write. No, no, we didn't assume H21 was one. We have a formula for H21. H21 can be much larger than one. But H1 one is. What one is H1? No, no, not, no, no. Neither is a condition here. It, it, it gives you all 14 in that list. In fact, in that list of 14, we didn't see this part in the original analysis, but the work with MMPA. We were able to show that all of them are fibered in that list of 14 by M1, M2, M3, and M4 polarized K3s. All, those are the only ones you can see torically because they're the only ones that show up as anti-canonical microservices in, in the threefold case, in, in the list of 4,319 polytopes. Right? M4 you only see by doing the argument on NBA, but then it's beautiful because then the structure of the generalized functional invariant map is uniform for all of these 14 examples. It's always in the form g of t equals a, which will be the deformation parameter for our cloudy s to the i plus j over t to the i times s minus t to the j, where so there's your rational function. And this, the parameter for, for the one parameter family of, of cloudy is in the list of 14 it's just scaling, just scaling your rational. Sure. Always the affine line? Always. So there's only one point of infinity that you're using. Um, no, there are other bad points, right? But they're the three points. It's always the three points. These three points are values of A? Yeah, values of A. What it's the same, the same three points we, we always knew about, right? The maximum unit of monodromy, the conifold, and, and the one of infinity, the quasi unit of And you see this very simply because, in effect, what happens is they're branched over three points and one extra point. And that one extra point can slam into three points. Those three points, for a given, for a given caveat, yeah, it's five or yeah. one P1, those three points being the special points. Mm -hmm. Right. Now but now you're referring like all those collapses. Yeah, but I, right, I understand. So there's a, the difference between the internal fibration and the modulus space of the threefold. And I'm asking about the modulus space of the threefold. And what I'm saying is the modulus space of the threefold is exactly what it was, right? It, would, it was p1 minus three points. With the third point determined by the third. And still is. It's, it's, it's just derivative. So you have, you have it in effect, um, in, in each of these, M, what characterizes M1 through M4 among all the MNs is that they are the ones where you're not only genus zero, but you have exactly three special points. M1 has two, three, infinity, just like the J line. M2 has, I think, two, four, infinity. M3, I believe, is two, six, infinity. And I think M4 is two, infinity, infinity. And that's it. So, that's the orbicurve structure of the target. 
and then you have this family of, of rational functions mapping to it. So this is a completely uniform geometrical construction of the families of the 14 mirror families. And, and that's why the classification told us something on the mirror side. You know, it's, it, because it's a uniform construction, we're not cheating. We're not using mirror information and saying, hey, look at magic. No, we're, we're constructing it from scratch. We're doing it in an intrinsic way. The only thing we're using is the variational Hodge structure data. Okay, and we're, and we're building it fiber-wise global Torelli for this class of K3s. And then we, we check. So, as a theory, Okay. The, the resulting theory, the general theory of lattice polarized K3 surface fiber Lavia threefolds, or threefolds, is robust. It's great. We can prove various general results about it. But in order to give it teeth, to make it actually predict anything, to make it actually explicit, you have to do the local analysis about the bad fibers, which means you have to have the results that are analogous to vinyl clinger. You have to have that algebra transcendental dictionary. Right, relating period data to actual algebraic models for your fiber K3s, and you have to have control over the moduli, that's where the modular parameterization comes in. So my anticipation is that if we lower the Picard rank, the theory is going to get much richer, but we're still going to be factoring through, instead of Hurwitz spaces, it will be moduli spaces with stable maps from rational curves to these, these K3 moduli spaces. The moduli spaces that you're making are coarse moduli spaces. Yeah, they're coarse. Now, can you add more structure and make them fun? I don't think so because you can't even do that with the K3s. Um, the K3s have, I mean, what makes the K3s work so well is that this is just the example of MM polarization, but in complete generality, we have a type 4 symmetric domain, so it's L polarized, a type 4 symmetric domain quotiented by an arithmetic group, and the arithmetic group is O plus of the integral transcendental lattice, um, you know, well, I guess associated to L. Okay? So the transcendental lattice is the orthogonal complement in the K3 lattice of so the, the, the non severity lattice. So you fix that L polarization, it's really L perfect in the K3 lattice. That's why in the rank 19 case we were really getting three by three matrices if you want integral matrices. And that's the group that's acting naturally on this type 4 symmetric domain. Beautiful story, you know, it's, yeah, it, it doesn't, okay? But even there, you just get a coarse modular space. You don't, you don't get a fine modular space. So you can't take some system of congruent subgroups and that kind of work on it? You can try, but, you know, what does it really mean, right? So, yeah, <laughs> right. So, I mean, so you do describe the, the sub, if, if, if you're doing, so I can give you some, some words on this. If what you're doing is looking at some lattice structure, well, then you have an interpretation of these as coming from algebraic curves. Okay? But I think what you're after really is substructure in the transcendental lattice. Uh -huh. So then what you're doing is you're doing some kind of a marking on these transcendental two cycles. Um, and it's not entirely clear to me what that should, what that should correspond to. So if you say that if we ask any more questions, our speaker is going to miss his chance for dinner. So if you'd like to ask more questions, please join me for dinner right now.